you're all good hello extempers people part of the speech debate community and anybody else listening to this podcast welcome to the half hour in today's podcast we will be discussing afghanistan and the events surrounding the united states and the taliban today we're your hosts i'm you you and i am spencer and this is a fairly new podcast idea that we came up with so just a little disclaimer here might not be the cleanest thing you've ever heard but the information is going to be very resourceful and important to be successful throughout the season as i've said before this podcast is about the current events surrounding afghanistan but what's unique about this podcast is we explain it in a way that helps you understand the topic as a whole and be able to approach extent questions in a way that's beneficial to you and how you're doing at a competition. So how this podcast is going to work is we are going to discuss the history of Afghanistan and the Taliban just briefly before moving on to possible extent questions and talking about how you can approach those questions and some hook ideas. I don't know. I'm not too great at hooks. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> Additionally, each of these episodes are going to look at both sides of current events while providing that background information. Um, we're also going to be looking into common questions that people have. So even though we're going to talk a lot about these two specific questions, we may even break down the common questions about those questions. So in addition to that, we're going to look at that towards these credible news sources from both sides to develop that answer. Plus, we're going to do in half an hour, which is the amount of time that you have to prepare your speech. So this should be able to be resourceful for you in that period of time to make sure that you have all the resources you need prior to prepping a speech. Mind you, do not listen to this podcast when you are about to give a speech. <laughs> listen to it before, but if it is an emergency type situation and you have no sources whatsoever for your speech, I'll allow it. Absolutely. So, without any further delay, why don't we go ahead and just delve right into it. So the first thing that we ought to talk about is the history of Afghanistan. And when we talk about the history of Afghanistan, our starting point tends to be, tends to be 1839, which is the beginning of the first Anglo-Afghan War. But let's keep this short and sweet. When we really talk about the Anglo-Afghan War, we know that this is a war that started as a result of failed negotiations for Britain to form an alliance with Afghanistan and Russia. But we look at 1839 as the starting point. War analysts actually show that this conflict in Afghanistan has been a lot longer. In their book, A Quick and Dirty Guide to War, authors James Dunnigan and Austin Bay note that the war has pursued for nearly 2,500 years in the region. And part of that is because Afghanistan was home to many religious wars. So in their 1985 publication, Dunnigan and Bay argued that the chance of conflict was higher because of its geographical location. Note that Afghanistan is not bounded by any water. It's surrounded by many other countries, which makes it vulnerable to conflict, not only from the outside, but also from inside. And we see that in 2021, that this prediction still holds very true. Fast forward to 2001, after the terrorist attacks on 9-11. New York Times author David Zucchino explains that a few weeks after the 9-11 attacks, President George W. Bush launched attacks against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. The goal in Afghanistan was to try to make it a stable democracy. Liberal theorists of international relations argue that since 1980, there has been a decrease in the amount of wars because of an increase in the amount of democracies. That's why the goal in Afghanistan was ultimately to make it a stable democracy. So it's fairly interesting, kind of off of that piece of information, that President Biden explains that we're not in this to do nation building when in reality the beginning goal in Afghanistan was to make it a stable democracy, to build its nation up so that way we can see a decrease in the amount of wars. In theory, this information is actually incorrect from our president. In 2009, President Obama sent more troops to Afghanistan in a move that reached nearly 100,000 by mid-2010. But the weird thing is that the Taliban was growing stronger, not weaker at this time. 
one of the most important notes in U.S. history. With 2011, our U.S. Navy SEAL team killed Osama bin Laden. But three years later, the Pentagon noted that this war is going for too long, and that it could only be settled via negotiation, and not war. So, it's very surprising that six years later, when the Trump administration held the peace talks with the Taliban in hopes to remove troops by May, of tw May 1st of 2021. Unfortunately, President Biden extended that deadline, and only recently, our troops have become removed. The Taliban agreed to cut ties with other terrorist groups and negotiate with an American-backed Afghanistan government. But there were no enforcements on that negotiation that existed. Keep in mind that when you have negotiations, it's very difficult to find ways to enforce them. Part ways that we could have done to enforce negotiations is through creating a way of bilateral trade. That way we can keep everything in check and if anything goes wrong we can cut ties with the Taliban or with the Afghanistan back government or with the American backed Afghanistan government. Well since the negotiation had led to the Taliban to stop attacking American troops, it is actually easy to see Dunnigan Bay's prediction. Note that this war has been going on for twenty years. There have been multiple actors that have been involved. Its location is not bounded by any form of water keeping the war to continue to go on, to find ways to expand territory. That might be the intention of the United States. So, simply put, the location of Afghanistan makes it easy for other actors to become involved in war and to lengthen the time frame of said war. In short, the thought of history repeating itself we know is not always true, but for some reason Afghanistan's long war history continues to see conflict. And that makes an important note that the Taliban is not there to stay, as war analysis continues to show an area that is vulnerable to conflict. And you, you, I think that personally, kind of looking at its geography, that really puts it into a, a very unique perspective. That we know that sometime in the future, some kind of war is going to persist. Yeah, I totally agree with that, because when you are talking about the Middle East and when conflict arises in any Middle Eastern country, because they're so connected to each other, conflict is always bound to happen. And when one state is in a state of instability and chaos, it affects the other state around them. So, for example, like it affects Pakistan because they are neighboring Pakistan. And we've seen a lot of like trouble in Pakistan, too. Maybe it's not based off of like Afghanistan's instability per se, but it still affects each country as they are trying to do their own thing and also like fight against India's control. Yeah. Absolutely. And ge geography does play a pretty predominant role when it comes to it. Like a lot of, there are books out there that will turn around and tell extempers, hey, Geography really isn't a big reason for conflict. Sometimes it's because of money. Sometimes it's because of religion. But Afghanistan's been one of those weird situations where it just, it's like a cycle. It just never stops. And when people say, well, we have to end Afghanistan's longest war, and it's been happening since 1839, they're not really looking at the big picture. It's something that's been happening far longer. Yeah. I agree with that too. I think we might have our disagreements, disagreements on why the war has been continuing for so long, but it is good to look at different factors and open up your perspective as to the causes of this war, just because, I mean, don't take our word for it because we're two college students trying to make our place in this world right now. And we're just here to provide you some information from resources that we have gathered. But you are 100% free to go and look at your own resources and form your opinions. That's what Extemp is here to help you do anyway. But on that note, I feel like diving into a little bit more detailed history about the Taliban and its connection to the United States would be beneficial to the current event or would be beneficial to understanding the current event that's happening right now. So the Taliban has been around since the 1990s, and technically speaking, they are a fairly new group. Prior to them, 
Afghanistan had suffered through lots of political turmoil due to religious reasons, like Spencer had mentioned, but also because of the Soviet influence in the region. The USSR backed a bloody coup against non-communist leader Mohammad Daoud Khan in 1978. And at that time, there were communist leaders in Afghanistan that wanted to take power and, you know, like the Soviets, rule in communist fa fashion. So a anti-Soviet group arose and they were called the Mujahideen. They didn't support Soviet rule at all in Afghanistan. And as a result, they received weapons and money from the United States. Now at that time, they received money and weapons from the United States as it was part of our Cold War policy, meaning we wanted to fight against Soviets and communism. So we would back groups that didn't support communism. The leaders of the Taliban before they were leaders of the Taliban, also fought alongside this group, but they eventually parted ways from this group to form their own, and that became the Taliban. And once the USSR pulled out of Afghanistan in 1989, a civil war ensued. It was the communist leaders against the anti-communist rebels. Chaos and instability happened throughout the city, or happened throughout the country, but especially in the capital city of Kabul, with rockets being launched from both sides. And again, we see history kind of repeating itself, chaos and conflict with two sides against each other and civil wars happening in Afghanistan. But the Taliban then presented themselves as, as Afghanistan's only hope of peace and stability. Generally, people accepted them when they took power in 1996 because they promised to stop corruption and prevent war crimes from happening ever again. And it just seemed like the people's only option of ever having a normal life. However, when they took power, they imposed a very strict interpretation of Islamic law, and the people generally accepted it because they didn't feel like they had anywhere else to go. But the media was pretty restricted. Sports was even restricted as games couldn't really happen during their five daily prayers. And something we all might know is that women were restricted from going to school and going to work. However, I did find a fun fact when reading this Al Jazeera article. Um, it stated that they stopped women from going to work and going to school unless it was women as doctors. And I think that's partly because they had a lot of casualties and you know, having doctors there would be probably beneficial to healing those people. But after all that happened, the United States really didn't intervene until 9-11. Because the main reason why the U.S. invaded Afghanistan in 2001 during the Taliban's rule was because 9-11 happened. You know, 9-11 was blamed on al-Qaeda, another group similar to the Taliban, but they had their ideological differences. At that time, Osama bin Laden, the former leader of al-Qaeda, was living in Afghanistan. The U.S. wanted the Taliban to hand over bin Laden, but they essentially refused. They said that they, we had no proof that Osama bin Laden had done it, and it's like not really in their, um, I guess, not really in their ideology to hand over bin Laden. They felt like that they could control Al Qaeda a little bit better if they stayed in their country. So, as a result, the Taliban was accused of harboring Al Qaeda refugees, and that was a huge no no for the United States. So the U.S. decided to launch an invasion in 2001, which toppled the Taliban rule, and then they had to scatter and hide in Pakistan. But they didn't just stay quiet in Pakistan, though, like Spencer said. A lot of things actually happened. For nearly 20 years before a peace agreement was reached, the Taliban has led an insurgency against U.S. forces in Kabul. That's 20 years of conflict, 20 years of casualties, and basically a lot for both the American people and I'm pretty sure also for the Afghanistan people as well. And in 2020 last year, former President Trump signed a peace agreement with the Taliban, basically saying, we will pull our troops out of Afghanistan in the next 14 months if you promise to not let Al-Qaeda do anything shady against the United States. It is important to note that they haven't severed ties with Al-Qaeda exactly, more so they are still allies in a sense, but allies as ways to control Al-Qaeda and not have them be so sporadic and like violent. We then entered into power sharing negotiations between the Afghanistan government that the US instituted and the Taliban. 
but those have been at a stalemate is the best way to describe it. And we haven't really seen any progress from those negotiations, I don't believe. I know there's a lot of news about it still, but it's like, I don't really think the Taliban wants to share power with the US-backed Afghan government. And I don't think they're gonna like make any negotiations with us anytime soon. So as of now, we're still continuing to pull troops out of Afghanistan, but that might be delayed due to Biden's announcement a couple of days ago and the fact that the Taliban has collapsed the Afghan government and taking control of Kabul. However, Biden is still focused on getting troops out of Afghanistan because his political plans are to deal with domestic issues for the United States and making the U.S. a competitor in the international market again. So focusing more on competing against China than anything else. But... I wish I could give you like a better conclusion to this little history lesson, but history is still in the making right now. So we have no idea what's about to happen and it causes for a lot of good extent questions to arise from this topic. Absolutely. And that jumps us perfectly into the first question. Uh, our first question that we have, and our questions will be coming from a website called Extemp Central. Uh, it's something that all Extempers should be able to use as a resource. It's very valuable. They pose about 10 United States and international topics every week. Our first question... And, oh, oh, just a side note on side that. Note. You'll probably be able to find the link to that website in the description of the podcast. Yes. Hopefully it's there. <laughs> Our first question, will failure in Afghanistan weaken the state of America's foreign alliances? Now, personally, I think that this is a pretty easy no. Um, and simply put, at the end of the day, when we're talking about America's foreign foreign alliances, we, the state of Afghanistan really doesn't have a lot to do with it. Um, and... We, we really talk a lot more about Europe when we talk about foreign alliances. European nations are the most that are involved with the United States when it comes to it. Okay. So the first thing that we always ask when it comes to like this kind of question is, who are America's foreign alliances specifically related to this question, and which ones is the question referring to? And the one that's really the most popular, the one that you're going to see most articles about, is Europe. Um, the truth is, is Europe has had a very close tie with the United States for a very long time. But the reason for that is because of its economy. The United States and Europe are more involved with each other economically than they are involved in wars, per se. Okay? So... The fact that the United States, yes, removed its troops and had a strong withdrawal from Afghanistan is not a reason why the failure in Afghanistan is going to weaken this state. You're going to see it more involved with the economy and maybe like disastrous economic issues that causes America's foreign alliances to break away. So, a really good example of this and I'm not entirely sure on the change, I do do not have the statistics, but I do know that at the end of last year, Europe had the most economic involvement in the United States. And when people say it's always China, it's actually Europe. Europe is one of the most popular, or one of the biggest countries involved in the U.S.'s economy. And the United States is just the same back. So, really, it's not going to break the state of America's foreign reliances because we're so involved in each other's economy to the point that there's really no point in seeing the failure in Afghanistan as the option of breaking away. It's more of we're going to try to keep involved with Europe because it benefits our economy and it benefits their economy as well. And I see, like, the answer to that, but if you were to answer, like, yes, it would weaken the state of America's foreign alliances, that's also a potential answer as well, because, yes, we are allied with Europe, but we are also allied with other people as well. Like, we're allied, well, we're not enemies with, kind of allied with China, mostly because, like, we do still trade a lot with them, 
and we get a lot of products from China as well. That might have been hindered due to like Trump's rhetoric of competing with China and now Biden's rhetoric of also like competing with China on the international market. But it is still a big thing to think about because if you look up anything about the Taliban right now and Afghanistan and how the U.S. is pulling out, you'll probably find articles that China is ready to fill the void. And that would be a potential risk for us and would weaken our alliance with them and probably with other nations as well because of the fact that China is going to fill in the void and they have access to million dollars of min minerals that are located in Afghanistan, which would help China like get more products, ship them out and become like a better competitor on the global market. That would weaken our alliance with China just because it cre creates this tension that, oh, so now that we're gone, you decide to fill in the void and cause all this trouble and chaos is what it looks like to the United States. And that's something that would weaken our alliance with them because it's like a stab in the back. And something to also consider is looking up articles about how this could affect um, you know, US China trade in the future and how it might also potentially affect our European trading partners as well, because they also trade with China. It's also like a big thing. We are interconnected globally. And Another thing to think about when answering this question is the term that they use is weaken the state of American alliance, America's alliances. And I know you talk about like how it's not gonna break away. And that is like a good approach when answering the question through like, no, but it is weakened. So even if it's not broken, it still might be weakened. And that would affect us dramatically if it causes like more tariffs to be put on our goods or if it causes like, things to not be traded anymore, or if it causes just more turmoil generally, when we talk about the potential actors that could fill into Afghanistan or the potential actors that want those minerals in Afghanistan. That is what could cause tensions between us and our allies and weaken our alliance with them. So that's another way to approach the question. Um, I think like structurally what I would do is I don't know, probably do a hook about my sister and I or something fighting over a piece of candy. I don't know. I'm not really great at hooks. But then I would go into like talking about a little bit about the history of Afghanistan within that attention getting device and then propose the question, answer it, give my three main points. And just off the top of my head, my three main points, if I were to answer yes, would be to talk about Europe, oh no, would be first to address how there's like resources in Afghanistan, then talk about our alliance with European countries, and then addressing our alliance with China, mainly. Kind of my approach. Oh. <laughs> uh, kind of my approach with that here. Um, I like I like that approach that you use provided. One of the things that I really focus on with Extemp is really how each of your point is or each of your points are organized. So I look at this thing called substructure and how you put each of these points together. And usually that's indicated by how a question is worded. So this question says, will failure in Afghanistan, which is an indication, will is future tense. So you should be making a prediction in this speech. So in that way, each of your points should be going from the past to the present to the future which develops a very smart answer to each point, and that way you fully answer the question. So if you were to answer no because of the alliance between the United States and Europe, each of your points is going to go to past economic history of Europe, to what just happened in Afghanistan, to what the future is going to be. So that's how each of your three points should be organized. And that really helps to develop a very smart answer to each point to each point and to give you a well-rounded answer. That way you answer the question. The number one mistake that a lot of extempers make is that they don't answer the question. And when you answer the question, you should be preparing yourself to answer it based on how the question is worded. And when it indicates the word will, it is always that you're going to make some kind of prediction. Yeah, and I think it's just an easy way to fix that problem is to just have the answer ready and upfront when you are like 
doing your hook, your beginning portion of your speech. When you can just say like, here's the question that I got and then say and the answer is yes, because of your three points that you have for your extent speech, it answers it directly and it gives you like a little bit more leeway when you're addressing your points. So even if you don't like fully address or answer the question within your points, you at least got your answer out in the beginning and it gives your judge um, a path to follow so that they can make conclusions themselves, even if it's conscious conclusions that they make. But with that, we can move on to the second question is what lessons should the US learn from the war in Afghanistan? A more open-ended question that doesn't have like a yes or a no answer. So when it comes to these type of questions, I mean, there are like multiple answers and right now you're probably just gonna hear about two. Um, so for me, I think what I would do to approach this question is to think about like the consequences of what has happened in the war in Afghanistan and how that has fared for the United States. And what it seems like is that the US probably shouldn't have gotten involved in the first place or probably tried to set up like a democracy in the first place because it didn't work. And we didn't like do all the procedures that's necessary to make sure that the democracy stayed stable and that the government had enough power to like fight against insurgencies and fight against rebellion. And to some extent, I do think an argument can be made that the government we have created there caused a lot of turbulence and a lot of polarization to happen in Afghanistan to where civil war would ensue, whether or not like we stayed there or not. I mean, if we if we had troops still there, which I'm not saying like we should still have troops there, it might be harder for rebellions to happen, but like I'm still saying they would happen, if you get what I mean. I I definitely agree with that. Um I think that when you really look at the big picture, there's really not a way that the United States wasn't going to get involved. Okay. Yeah. Um, 9-11 was going to be a big reason why we were going to go to war. Um, mm -hmm. So with that being said, I think a lot of this war was inevitable. Okay. So I think that the lesson that really the United States needs to look at is really on the back end of it. So my answer to this question would actually be implementing a negotiation with a stronger enforcement. Because I think that at the end of the day, this is a really, this is a situation that happened, it unfolded. Like, yes, we weren't prepared really coming into that for the insurgencies that you just mentioned. But was that something that we were going to be able to avoid? And I don't think that that is a yes. So... Everything that really unfolded here came because of that lack of enforcement with that negotiation. So truthfully, the lesson that the United States needs to learn from this war is if you're going to end the war and you want to end the war by popular demand, you need to have some kind of enforcement mechanism in place to make sure that this war is ended in peace. And that is definitely not what happened here. That The Trump administration making the decision to negotiate with the Taliban is a very good move. And I don't think the pre former President Trump gets enough credit for that. Because that is very, very good. However, that not having the negotiation that have that kind of enforcement really backfired here. And that is kind of what hurt President Biden here. There was a really good CNN article that stated that ending the war in Afghanistan was never going to help him politically. And the reason why is because the questions and polls surrounding it are super loose. This is what, this is what CNN stated. It, when asked to leave the war in Afghanistan, the majority of Americans supported it. But when Americans were asked to stay and pursue counterterrorism opportunities, people supported to stay. So it was completely split. So the whole mechanism here is we have to find a way to implement a negotiation that ends with some kind of enforcement. And that enforcement would have ultimately 
ended the war in Afghanistan in peace and not in the way that you have an uproar from the Taliban. Yeah, and I agree with that too. So like a little saying that could help summarize that point would just be, you know, the U.S. shouldn't bite off too much that they can't chew it, you know. I'm probably not saying that right, but you get what I'm saying. If we kind of just like go in with a goal, but then we don't fully like reach that goal. And we know that there's a possibility that we don't reach that goal, then there's going to be problems that arise from that. And that is going to like affect us and affect like innocent civilians and also affect the international community as well. And when we, you know, look at the war in Afghanistan and we see what has been happening, the casualties that arose from it, the innocent civilians that are being stuck in Afghanistan, it really makes you like wonder and like rethink the decisions that we made and the things that we have failed to do. And it's kind of like when you're looking at the situation, it doesn't seem like the government had a set and ready to go plan that was going to help us end the war in Afghanistan peacefully and not have, you know, this insurgency lead to the Taliban taking over Afghanistan and citizens being trapped there. And then like when you take a look at this question, there's also another approach that you can go about answering in more so like we've learned our lesson now. What we need to do now is to like I don't know, get the refugees out of Afghanistan, for example. That's something that uh, people have been calling for because we don't want like innocent people to suffer and people are like trying to flee the country. There's literal videos of people handing their babies to soldiers because they're scared. And it's like the saddest thing in the world. So I don't think any judge is going to dock you if you say like, hey, yes, we caused this mess to happen and we probably should have like taken our troops out but we also do still need to like help the people. And what we can learn from this is that like, we need to clean up our messes. That's also like another way to approach this question too. And actually that really makes a really good attention grabber, believe it or not. You, you can talk about, there, there are articles out there that specifically a really good source would be The Guardian. The Guardian does a really good job in its first paragraph of telling like this really deep personal story and a personal story of somebody that's happening, of somebody that's currently having problems in Afghanistan, maybe handing their baby to a soldier to get them evacuated. You use that, and then you make sure that you mention the Guardian there, and you can end that with a twist that ultimately allows for a really strong attention grabber. And the judge is hooked right away in this kind of emotional, dark sense. Like... You don't always have to think of attention grabbers as funny as like because some some topics are not appropriate for a funny attention grabber. This question would be a very good example of one. If you're using a like a comic attention grabber for a war that has killed a lot of people, um, you are making a pretty big mistake because you don't know if that judge has had somebody who has died from that war. And immediately you are turned into this situation that you're, I mean, you do have a little bit of an implicit bias on you now. And that, that is something that, yes, judges should keep out of consideration, but you want to describe this kind of topic in a perspective that people really understand. In something very dark, like an emotional story that somebody told to a reporter is really a good attention grabber and that starts your speech on the right foot and really draws and paints a perspective that explains hey this is what's going on and this is why the United States needs to learn from its lessons yeah I 100% agree I've used like very sad stories as hooks before and it just helps get the point across because it really helps put you in that person's shoes to understand the perspective that you're about to tell because if it's like a answer that might be like heavily leaning left or heavily leaning right it might not like pull your judges in so much if you're just you know bam 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 with all this information 
But if you put it into perspective and use a hook that fits so that the judge can understand, then it's easier for them to be like, okay, I might not agree with you, but I understand what you're trying to say and I'll listen to you still and I'll judge you based off of your performance and not so much your content. So yeah, when it comes to a topic such as Afghanistan and when it comes to today's world of polarization, it is something that we can't avoid. Like we have to be mindful about how what we're saying and how we're saying it and how we're forming our opinions in a way that's not so loaded um and like I don't know I don't know a good way to to say what I'm trying to say but like just be careful about how you phrase things I think what you're trying to get at is you don't know hey you you don't you don't know what that judge has been through right Mm -hmm. you you don't know what just happened to them in the last week what they ate for breakfast uh if something Mm -hmm. If something's just not been going right during the day and yeah. that that's really one of the most important parts when you're developing your speech especially when it comes to the attention grabber because you could just say the wrong thing and it puts them in the wrong place and it might be the wrong time and that situation is just a lose 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 you, you there's no way that you can really win from that mm-hmm. yes it's cool to have something funny and I, I think everybody likes a to hear a good joke like i'm a big fan of john mulaney i love him as a comedian right but there's times and places where you shouldn't be using a line from john mulaney to open up an extemp speech hey you make sure when you come when you're reading what the topic is that it's something that maybe you have multiple intros for this one would be an example of don't go for something funny. But if you were to have something that you think you can get something funny with, it, sometimes it might be also better just to have multiple intros, walk into the room, read the room, and see what's going on before your speech even starts. And that way you can come up with something that's very smart for what the room can really handle. Because maybe you have something funny that's about the economy as just kind of an off-topic example, but you can have something funny about the economy. And your judge, maybe somebody, when you walk into the room, is somebody that wouldn't appreciate a joke about the economy because something's been going wrong recently. That would be a really good example of a time that you would need some kind of, like, secondary intro. And it's always good to have multiple ideas lined up and to read the room before you walk in and realize, oh, hey... Maybe my intro is not that great of an idea. And also, no, we're just talking about changing up your intros, not necessarily your whole entire speech. Like, you can still keep the speech the same and have your opinions that you formed to present. It's just when you are presenting them, uh, be mindful that there are different opinions out there and not everybody's going to agree with you and see it your way. So don't be so blunt. Yeah, don't be so blunt sometimes because... Some people can't handle that. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. I think that concludes our podcast really well. We got some extra tips at the end there for you. And I hope all of you enjoyed what we had to say. Uh, If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, feel free to DM either of us. We will address them happily. And all of our sources are listed in the description. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for listening or watching or whatever you are doing today to enjoy the immense amount of information that we have put into this podcast. We did a we did a lot of research, so we very much appreciate every minute of your undivided attentions. So thank you all so much, um, and we hope to catch you next week. Bye.